President Obama said a massacre in Libya was avoided because America intervened. What now for the U.S. as the crisis continues? March Madness culminates with the Final Four. Underdog VCU hopes to make basketball history. Famed sports announcer Billy Packer joins us. And on the last word, can a government shutdown be avoided? The United States has spent close to $600 million so far in military operations in Libya. And President Obama now says he may consider sending arms to the rebels. We begin the show with our all-star reporter roundtable, Lara Sadrakian from Dubai, White House reporter Hans Nichols, and Bloomberg diplomatic correspondent Indira Lakshmanan. Lara, let me start with you. The goal is to get rid of Gaddafi, not the military mission. What if there's a more protracted stalemate? What are the implications? Well, Al, we're already seeing signs that this could take a while. We're seeing heavy fighting this week around towns like Misrata and Ras Lanou, some of the key oil ports in Libya. And a sense here that this is really in some ways overshadowed by a geopolitical war of attrition. The force and the resources on one side versus the force and the resources on another. We're watching closely for defections. Musa Kusa leaving Gaddafi's camp. That's a huge chip out of his corner. And Gaddafi, you know, really facing a situation where the weight of the Arab world, as represented by Qatar, is now behind Benghazi. That's one of the biggest signs that we're moving towards a Libya without Gaddafi in power. Uh, as Tom Freeman said, the White House has to hope that uh, Obama's lucky. Uh, there's more than hope. There's debate right now. Very serious question on whether or not you arm the rebels. In a lot of ways, this is a harder question than the no-fly zone one because you don't have clear lines that are emerging in the administration. You're having a lot of people argue different sides. Indira, how about Gaddafi staying for a while? Well, I think that's the opposite of what the administration wants. They don't want a protracted struggle. They want this to go away. Their hands are full in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Don't forget, we've still got forces in Iraq. And big decisions, though, if he stays for a while. H huge decisions. I think what is happening behind the scenes is the administration and our European allies are trying to work on some sort of an exile plan. There's definitely a camp working on what can be done to get Gaddafi out quickly and cleanly and ideally probably to a country that is not a signatory to the statute that set up the International Criminal Court. What's the division within the administration over, over arms to the rebels? In, in some ways the debate is, um, as Hans was referring to, you know, mirroring that of the no-fly zone. But I think the large your question is, who are these rebels? If you're going to arm them, we need to know who they are. And while there has been talk on Capitol Hill about some possible al-Qaeda elements, the intelligence doesn't really bear that out. What was really interesting to me is the possibility that there are some reactionary forces who are leading the rebels, including the two main rebel commanders we know of. One was an interior minister for Gaddafi. One was in self-imposed exile in Vienna, Virginia, not far from Langley CIA headquarters yeah, for Virginia. 20 years. <laughs> and, uh, the home of all rebellions. Who's on which side? Huh? Well, there are a lot of different debates going on, debates within debates. Then you get in the question of do you do it through the military or do you do it through the CIA? If you do it through the military, that requires congressional notification. It's out in the open. If you do it through the CIA, it's covert. The way it's leaning right now is you're going through the military. That means it'll be out in the open because they want to be very clear. This is a very difficult decision, and they want to be up front with Congress because they know there could be recriminations down the line because you just don't know who all is part of this rebel force. Lara, what do your sources over there tell you about this rebel force and what kind of influence Al-Qaeda has or doesn't have? Well, they're relatively encouraged. They think this notion of extremists taking over Libya is overblown, partially because of the tribal structure of that country. Uh, they're really going to be holding down a lot of the power politics in any post-Qaddafi Libya. And they also just feel that anything now would be better than Qaddafi. He has zero friends left, certainly among the Arab leadership, Saudi Arabia, no friend of Qaddafi's. And really, the, the sense here that they are all doing whatever it takes to support them. This, even this debate over whether to arm the rebels sounds a little bit ridiculous for from here, from Qatar's angle, certainly, if you pick a side and you back it, you really make an investment, and at least that's the anticipation here, that that's what we're seeing. So the question of how much this costs is something that is not uh, high on the radar screen in the Arab world. Is that, is that fair to say? 
Absolutely, and that's part of the rhetoric that seems off from here. A lot of voices asking me, why is a superpower becoming a bean counter? This whole notion of cost per Tomahawk missile makes them scratch their heads, basically. I mean, why now, after so much of a cost overrun in Iraq and Afghanistan, are you suddenly penny pinching? And they really want to see a situation where the U.S. makes the most of this. Al, just to give you a sense of color, when you're watching Al Jazeera here, you see pictures of Libyans waving the American flag in thanks instead of burning it in effigy. That's a complete inversion of what we're used to out here. Hans? Well, the, the question of, well, do the rebels actually, are they worthy of the support is what's bedeviling the administration right now. And you asked about the sides earlier on who is where. It's not as clear as the no-fly zone. But is the cost factor 600 billion versus, or 600 million or whatever it is, versus 800? Does that matter? Uh, it's not high on the White House's list. The president's been very clear that they've budgeted into this, that this is something. These are contingencies they plan for. You're not really hearing anyone, senior administration officials, talking about the cost of this right now. They're talking about the consequences. That is, if you end up arming people who have ties to al-Qaeda. You're hearing the same thing at Foggy Bottom. Well, let's talk about cost for a moment. I mean, $600 million in the grand scheme of things is chump change. Um, at the same time, you know, when you compare it to our other military involvements, the U.S. part of this bill was supposed to go down substantially with the NATO takeover. While the U.S. amount was larger at the beginning, once NATO took over command and control, it's supposed to be more 50-50. How much this is going to cost us at the end of the day depends on how long this goes, which comes back to your question of how protracted it is. This region is full of surprises over the last couple months, and one, another surprise is Syria. Assad is facing his own rebellion. What are your State Department sources telling you? Look, they're watching this very carefully, and there's a lot of disappointment at Foggy Bottom about Bashar al-Assad, because when he first came to power, this young son of the former longtime leader, he promised reform. And while he has done some reform on the economic front, he's done nothing on the political front from the point of view of the U.S. and its allies. And so their main strategic goal of the U.S. and its European partners in Syria is to try to divide it from Iran as much as possible, to divide it from Hezbollah. What they're watching now are some fractures within the Alawite minority that runs the country, and to the extent that that continues, we may be seeing something serious there. We're not going to be sending uh, uh, air power into Syria, though, Hans. Uh, probably not, but we, it's in a reminder of just how complicated everything is for the White House. In the White House Situation Room, the clock that used to show Islamabad now shows Tripoli. It's a reminder that, once again, Pakistan could blow up. It's, they have so many complicated issues on so many different fronts, and they just have one president who's dealing with it. A lot of different issues at just one time. Lots of Opportunities, but lots of dangers. Lara, uh, let me ask you. Uh, Assad gave a speech the other day. What do you? How do you hear? Hear it went over in Syria. Well, it wasn't what most people in Syria wanted to hear, and that frustration that Indira is pointing to at Foggy Bottom is definitely a felt force in Syria, a sense that the reform just isn't coming. And you saw a lot of the dynamic in the stagecraft of that speech, so much of the old guard that Bashar al-Assad inherited from his father standing up, clapping in ovation, and a sense that that really points the way forward, that they're hardening, that they're planning to crack down and just keep driving this at their own pace. And again, you know, we're seeing this reshape the politics out here, that axis of Syria, Hamas. Hezbollah, Iran, you now have two of those countries, Syria and Iran, really shaken by domestic unrest. So really uh, just a sense out here that you're walking on a waterbed when it comes to the politics of this region. It's just so shaky. Well, Lara Satrakian, thank you very much. And Dara Lakshmanan and Hans Nichols, thank you. Welcome back. We'll go to Margaret Carlson and Cato Bernie in just a moment. But first, this month's jobs numbers are out and they were better than expected. The economy added 216,000 jobs. Bloomberg's chief economics reporter, Rich Miller, is here to fill us in on the details. This report, awfully good, Rich. Even Dr. Gloom can't find <laughs> bad stuff in this. You're right. I mean, it was a very good report. Uh, companies are, are adding jobs at a pace of a half million jobs over the last two months. That's the best performance uh, uh, in five years. But, you know, in keeping my tradition of being like a gloomy gust, the one thing they, the companies aren't doing are paying people wages. Wages have been stagnant like four out of the last five months. Well, there also are trouble spots, aren't there? Housing, gasoline prices, consumer confidence. That, that's why, you know, the, 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 the lack of wage growth is, is a little disturbing. You know, gasoline prices are going up, food prices are going up, housing prices are going down. Fortunately, you know, the, we did have this payroll tax 
tax cut uh, that came in at the start of the year, and that's helping people cope with this. But if, if gas prices keep going up, it's going to be more of a drag on the economy as the year goes on. How about the long-term outlook, though? Lord Keynes reminded us in the long term we're all dead, but how right. about the longer-term outlook? Well, I mean, what we seem to be getting is like a cyclical upswing in the economy. But if you look underneath it, we, you know, we might have some structural problems. Over the last 18 years, uh, according to a study by um, Mike Spence, who's a Nobel laureate uh, in NYU, uh, most of the jobs growth has been in government and in healthcare and in retailing. And if you look ahead, it's hard to see that being replicated. So we may have to find new industries, new sources of jobs as we go forward. Yeah, to turn to the Federal Reserve, William McChesney Martin may be turning over in his grave, but uh, to uh, uh, further taking down the veil of secrecy, Ben Bernanke is going to hold four press conferences a year? The, the feeling at the Fed is, you know, that the institution is, is sort of uh, held, held in pretty poor regard, but Bernanke himself, people like him, even people on the Hill like him. So they, they're trying to use him to sort of burnish the institution's uh, image. We'll, we'll see if okay. it works. Well, the Fed was forced by Bloomberg's suit to release details of uh, what banks borrowed as discount window during the credit crisis. Rich, what did we learn? I guess the biggest thing we learned was that we, we, this is not just the central bank to the United States. This is the central bank to the world. There was a, a, a whole slew of foreign uh, companies, including a, a bank partly owned by, believe it or not, the Central Bank of Libya that was borrowing money during the crisis. Oh, boy. Well, all right. Thank, uh, actually, uh, a relatively buoyant Rich Miller today. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let me turn to Kate and uh, Margaret. Margaret, government shutdown likely? Mm -hmm. Let me be buoyant. Good. I would say because John Boehner does not have the bloated ego of Newt Gingrich, I think he's capable of compromise, talking his caucus into it, you know, possibly snatching victory from the jaws of defeat, which a shutdown would be for them. Because they've already basically won, haven't they, Kate, on well, the... Margaret's right that the Republican leadership certainly doesn't want to shut down, but I think the chances are better than 50-50 that there'll be one nonetheless because the Democratic leadership wants a shutdown. They'd rather talk about a shutdown and try to put the onus on Republicans than confront the fact that they are deeply divided and will not cut a nickel from the federal budget. Kate, let me ask you about this. We're talking a lot about what goes on in Washington, but what's going on in the states uh, in some ways is more interesting. The popularity of new Republican governors who have ambitious agendas in taking on public employees, Scott Walker, John Kasich, Rick Scott, have all nosedived yeah. in right. the last week or so. Is that a harbinger or a blip? Well, Ella, I don't think it's surprising. They've all taken out an incredibly well-organized, uh, aggressive special interests who feel, obviously, the reforms directly. And the benefits of those reforms are diverse and abstract at the moment. They have plenty of time to recover, uh, unlike Barack Obama, who's whose ratings on the budget and spending are in the tank. Right. Pitting worker against worker uh, is a short-term strategy. Um, uh, scapegoating public workers was a short-term strategy. Once people realized that, for instance, Walker was giving a tax cut and then cutting benefits for public workers uh, and going after collective bargaining, that's when he began to lose. And as people learn what happened, you know, they're, these people are basically fair-minded, and it's not fair. And uh, all, are these all different situations, Walker, Kasich, Scott, Chris Christie, or uh, can, we, can we differentiate? No, a common thread is the public sector unions, right. but it's not work against workers, it's public sector unions against taxpayers. Well, I think it's, I think how Walker got going was to scapegoat public workers and say, did you have any idea what you're getting when, look at what's happened to the private sector. Uh, you know, there are differences because Chris Christie is a little bit better at it than, say, uh, Walker. I think the governors who are no longer automatically deducting dues from paychecks of state employees are on the side of state employees. Why should they have their paychecks docked involuntarily? If they want to join a union, they're free to do so. Because we all know payroll deductions are how we pay our bills electronically. Because they don't payroll want to give, they don't want to give no, public sector that, employees a choice. Yes. Margaret's for paying bills. That's good. All right. The final four this weekend, March Madness, the culmination. So Who exciting. Who is going to be the big the national champion on Monday night? Margaret Carlson. Uh, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has not won many lately, so let me say Kentucky. The Kentucky Wildcats. Huh? Very kind of Margaret. Uh, my adopted state, of course, is Virginia, and I'm a bleeding heart conservative. I'm going to root for the underdog, VCU. Well, Kate, I got to tell you, as much as I would, as much as I would love VCU to win, I'm cheering for the Rams. I suspect it's going to be Connecticut, but we will see. Thank you all, and thank all of you for joining us, and we'll see you again next week. 
Political Capital is a production of Bloomberg Television.